It makes you so much more productive. Hello, how are you? Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, founder and podcast producer at Max Podcasting, and you can reach me at max and maxpodcasting.com to help bring your podcast to life and use it as a business building tool. This is episode 127, and today's guest is Rihanna Lynn. Rihanna is the founder and CEO of Journey Foods, a crazy cool next generation food technology platform that combines food, science, food science, and technology. They provide an amazing amount of cost savings, time savings, and data to help innovative food companies scale. And in this interview, we talked about how Rihanna is building Journey Foods while avoiding burnout. It is Rihanna. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with Rihanna Lynn, the amazing founder and CEO of Journey Foods, who has uh, had quite the uh, business experiences well before that as well. Rihanna, thanks for joining today. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm, I'm down here in Austin, Texas. We got some good weather going on. Grateful uh, for, for all the lessons and, and the opportunity to, to share a little bit here with you uh, today, Max. Absolutely. And incredibly jealous on the weather. So make sure to uh, <laughs> share some of that with, with me and, and so many others later. But we're going to get into plenty of things that I'm, I'm sure will make me hungry over the course of this interview. I'm, I'm fascinated by food and so many of your touch points involve food and a focus on a wide range of aspects of food. To start off, why do people like food so much? <laughs> That's such a loaded question. I love that question, actually. You know, for me, I always think about food in two ways, That's or, or three ways, probably. That's uh, the community, the history of food, uh, the history of your family's food, the history of your, your own individual lifestyle and, and your, your food experiences. And so I would say uh, food matters because uh, the community and the stories that uh, we remember and we continually praise every time we eat a meal. Journey Foods largely thinks about the second area uh, and that's closely related to my background and that's around science and health and wellness of food and not just for satiating and making us full, but keeping us ticking, right? So food matters because we, we need to feel good every day and uh, it's one of those keystones of our lives. They say we all need a farmer three times a day here. And so uh, it's just important to us for our livelihoods. And then finally, food feels so good <laughs> when you have it and it's right and it tastes good. And it's meeting your, your all of your different senses. Uh, and so, yeah, we need water, right? Every day and water is pretty great. Uh, but when you get that like delicious burger or the right cheese or uh, a perfect avocado or mango. I mean, there's nothing better. Taste and olfactory senses and the gastronomy of food is is just a wonderful blessing from Mother Nature. We just need it. It's it's necessary. It's a necessity, and it it's food porn. It's community. It's history. It's genes. It's health. It's so many things. And um, I I love being a part of the food industry and finding innovative ways to keep enjoying it every day. Well, that was a loaded answer. No, that, that was <laughs> that <is> a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> I know we could we could do this all day, but that's so true. There's so many wonderful elements of it, and, and I'm someone who like gets so excited for the next meal, and I think halfway through that meal is so excited for the next meal, and maybe two meals after <laughs> that. So like, there's something, there's just some quality of like so much pleasure that comes from it. Your career, you've started and been such a big part of so many companies involved either directly or, or advising in the food space. What is it that has drawn you to food professionally? You know, I think it was part of my upbringing, just being around parents, grandparents, uh, especially 
that either worked in food, grew up on farms, showed me a young age, household gardening, farming, uh, and then having a grandfather that sold, or at least local grass-fed meats, uh, and a grandmother that was probably one of the, <laughs> I joke around a lot, but like probably one of the OG, like first black yoga instructors in the country. Uh, she's been doing it for five decades almost, has been vegetarian for almost as long, uh, and just taught me about the value of quality food and food systems. And I knew I wanted to be a scientist early on. I didn't know I wanted to dedicate my life to food, but by the time I graduated college, started uh, graduate school really early, I was looking for ways to hack my way to success. And I landed on food because it was just, it became an overarching theme in everything I was working on. Um, I was living in Hyde Park right by University of Chicago in the middle of a food desert uh, in one of the most endowed and top colleges uh, or universities in the world. And so that, that intrigued me. And a lot of my work uh, in studies and science, as I thought I wanted to be, you know, this lab scientist and work with uh, in genetics kept pointing back to food. Uh, and so it was really like this upbringing of mine and, and just seeing like my local community facing food shortages, food problems, food health issues. And I, I launched a food company with a family member when I was 23 and it, it took off quite fast. And, and I realized then on a socioeconomic level, every single socioeconomic level of people across the country and obviously the world deals with a lot of food problems. This could be um, everything from having issues around celiac disease or, or gluten. We all face issues with like sugar. I'm a 90s kid. And uh, any 90s kid knows that we were forced uh, by, you know, what at, was deemed innovative at the time to uh, essentially be guinea pigs of the food industry. So everything from Gushers to Twinkies to... Oh, my God. <laughs> to flaming hot Cheetos to, like, fake juices that just had, like, sugar water color. I mean, these are things that uh, we're, we're going to deal with now as we face like a lot of chronic disease and just all these themes uh, kept coming up in my work and my research and friends, family, myself, of course, uh, we all have to have dealt with it. And um, I, I just haven't been able to step away. And there's so many problems that we can solve, but also it's still so exciting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got excited when you said gushers because I remember the whole thing of like do you eat them one at a time or do you eat them like all of them attached to each other all at once yeah they're all they're all attached now I had gushers for the first time like two weeks ago but I mean they they had CBD in them but I ate them all at once <laughs> <laughs> there there you go I hadn't thought about it that way but yeah and same way growing up in the 90s like there were so many innovative and enticing food snack creations but then I think once you grow up and mature a little bit it's like wow we were eating a lot of sugar <laughs> growing up <laughs> you know and all sorts of sugar, things yeah like crazy food dyes that purple ketchup yeah yeah I mean the thing that fact that really stuck out to me was when I I, I can't remember the class but it, I always paid attention to countries around the world and their um, average age of death you know, it's funny to me that like the U.S. wasn't like always number one, but we're all the top country and you would pay attention to like Asian and Mediterranean diets and then look at like the diets of people that are predicted to live to like 48 and in, in developing nations, but they have no chronic disease, no diabetes or cancer or anything. It's just like communicable diseases or, or, or war. What was really fascinating to me is seeing the fact that like our grandparents are going to live, are predicted to live longer than our parents. And that just like blew my mind. Um, as you get older and you start to think about the fact that like, you know, you start thinking about like your parents passing away. And a lot of this is associated with chronic disease and, 
you know, I speak a lot on in presentations about how food is our $3 trillion problem. Uh, we spend $3 trillion globally on food that's packaged process and it's really the number one cause of chronic disease uh, across the world. And for, for that reason, I've, I've just been intentionally focused and drawn to like such an interesting world that's largely been disconnected um, from our bodies and our overall wellness. Like the food and the wellness and the medicine industries do not work together. They do not care about each other. They sort of are as profiting in a cyclical way. Uh, I think it's just, it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, there's now opportunities to change that. And, you know, we're, we're focused on that uh, with Journey Foods uh, and, and finding ways to like accelerate the gaps that we have in understanding how we develop billions of products every month for so many people. Let's get to Journey Food specifically. Where did this idea for Journey Foods come from? As I launched the juice bars and we started selling like raw foods and other small delivery, meal delivery, pre-packaged meals uh, that could go into delivery and, and pick up. Uh, we ran into a lot of supply chain issues early on and that basically led to um, me getting some experience uh, developing tool, getting some experience at Google, and also working on the venture capital side. I'm very grateful of my experiences over the past decade. And now that I've matured in my early 30s, <laughs> <laughs> I, I still, and as I spent more time with like founders and engineers uh, in Silicon Valley and, and other fast paced innovation cities um, in different regions, I realized that like they're building tools that are really great for the industry, especially like FinTech and either like food delivery or e-commerce, but there's like still not enough software and data for food that we eat and for the workers and the companies that we were either funding from my end or I've advised, they have like no B2B software. <laughs> the B2B software that exists for the industry is really like to manage logistics or to manage e-commerce but nothing that's like sort of great for business insights or helping you make better decisions about like the ingredients you use or how that's going to impact your customers or like how it's going to impact the environment. And so there just seemed to be this really open opportunity to take the best practices of B2B software uh, and infuse it into uh, the food industry, into the packaged food industry. And, and I decided to link with a good friend of mine to really think through the methodology and the approach and, and, and what the company roadmap would look, look like. He, at the time, was developing Skittles <laughs> for different regions around the world and working on some Skittles products in China. I just sat down and read the book, a, a book um, on the history of uh, fruit snacks been around since late 1800s started in in england uh, in the uk and uh london became sort of this snack mecca for fruit snacks and and sweets uh i sort of you sort of get like the the early charlie in the, in the chocolate factory kind of vision as you read it what was interesting and what you what I started to realize is like fruit snacks are in every country, every corner of the world. Uh, they may have different textures or different flavors, but it's it's sort of recession proof. They're sort of recession proof. So I thought like, let's take this sort of recession proof, widely known food product model and like play around with it and like track as much data as we can develop a little portal to really see what we can, what levers we can pull and change without going through traditional food manufacturing, food science processes. And so we were able to do a little bit of that and adjusting sugar, adjusting prices, adjusting uh, ingredients and a little bit of the procurement. And that was just super fun. And as I've started presenting it in late 2018 and early 2019, uh, there were just companies of all sizes, some like global multinational companies 
asking for our services for all types of food products, like everything from salsas to noodles to breads, cookies. Um, and it just, it sort of just took off from there. And it's gotten to the point where you have millions of data points now. How do you even start there? Like, how do you and team and obviously the the software, you're not doing, just doing all this manually counting, but how do you and team track and portray this data in such a, I guess, pun intended, digestible format? <laughs> So uh, what I decided to do early on was as we developed the software, so we're really focused on one, portfolio management. So bringing in your ingredients, your products that are concepts or out in retail, your packaging, uh, the, the scope of your uh, food products into a dashboard. Uh, and you can import those through different tools. As we decided like how, what data we wanted to layer over it, which levers the type of methodology that we could build the data schema around so that we could have like, my goal is to build one of the most actionable food databases uh, in the world. The, the, the strategy behind doing that has been to pair food scientists that have really just been available in the industry for only the past like 40, 50 years, pretty new science and, and data engineers together to think through uh, how we would organize the data, clean data, uh, create actionable steps for our customers. And that's uh, worked out really well for us. Um, when I first pitched the idea of what we wanted the software and the data to do, uh, there were a lot of scared food scientists, especially older ones. Like, you can't do that. You need to do X, Y, Z. Uh, and we just kept pushing and pushing on um, the, the experience for our customers and getting all these feedback loops on uh, what their needs were. And so uh, I've just been super grateful that there are food scientists that were very tired of their processes. They were tired of the consulting practices that kept the development cycles super long, that kept our products from getting healthier faster or more sustainable faster or more flavorful, whatever it, it, it may be, the processes are very inefficient. And so uh, working with data engineers that either care about food or love food, but like have no experience uh, working in food uh, has been a really fun process. And it's blown my mind that fruit snacks have been around way longer than food scientists have. And you mentioned the feedback loop. In terms of working with your customers, what do your customers often find as the most valuable thing that you provide? <laughs> Time and cost savings. <laughs> that, those are big ones. Yeah, we, we track that. We found ways to track those uh, in the dashboard and sort of compare like traditional processes uh, to ours uh, so they can see exactly how much money and, and time they're saving uh, by using the platform. But we've found uh, it, it's th there's been varying levels of uh, interest and feedback loops on what's been most impactful. Uh, a lot of software companies are very siloed and sort of scared and competitive. If you have seen a lot of trends in, in software and even consumer apps, you know a lot of them are integrated, right? So we're using like Google Sign On, or you can pull your data from like spreadsheets, or you know. Zoom works with Gmail calendar. There's just like integrations galore. Like if you use Slack, there's all these marketplaces for apps that you can add on. And it is not like that in the food industry. The apps don't want to work together. Different departments at the same company, like Oreo has to go through 15 different software platforms to get to the store. <laughs> My goal was to think and sort of break that model and try to find as many ways to build integrations and different APIs. Uh, as possible so it could be a very seamless process for our users. And so I think a very exciting thing has been integrations. And, and so that like a procurement officer can communicate with a food scientist, can communicate with a product manager, and can communicate with the marketer, right? So like if the marketer knows that like we maybe need to look at products that are more sustainable or have better packaging or, or, or we need more plant-based, items we can loop back over to sort of procurement and 
uh, different supply chain metrics that help us understand like if we suggest a change to your yogurt to now make it plant-based and less sugar we know that like those ingredients are available your consumers are demanding that and you're also going to meet like the regulatory uh, requirements to develop that process and so instead of all these roadblocks to innovation that typically can take a company anywhere from like nine months to five years, we really tried to shorten that by uh, creating this broader integrated system. Well, thank you for doing that. Like you said nine months to five years and I just like got frustrated. I'm not even in the food space and I got frustrated thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of companies know that we we wanted like, I bring up Oreos because they've been announcing like gluten-free Oreos, right? Q4 2020, they're just now starting to become available. Like we needed gluten-free Oreos five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> like they, they kind of knew that. Um, and so f- the fact that it, they're just coming out is like crazy to me. In terms of the roadblocks that you talked about and areas there, you are able to create these efficiencies, these seamless integrations. What are some other of the most common pain points that you see when you start to work with a new company in the food space, whether they're starting a new food brand or, you know, part of a giant CPG? No, oftentimes it's sort of, um, you know, like how do we make an item that has certain functionality, let's say like it's good for gut health or mood or the, you know, it meets sort of keto threshold. So it's low sugar, um, but it also has the right flavor profile based on some integrations we can bring in. and there's enough of that ingredient and you and you can match us back to the manufacturers that like and the suppliers that can bring us those uh, ingredients to make this like beverage or this power bar that is healthy enough for us for our customers right or meets the the desires of our customers so our when when every customer comes onto our platform they fill out an extensive goals flow that helps us create a very personalized data for their team. Uh, and we're able to generate early recommendations from there. But what's also what's been exciting is that they can bring all their data of existing products. Uh, and so the first, first stream of impact for our customers is for us to scan their existing products that they already have in retail and notify them to specific changes they may need to make that are like FDA or like regulatory changes, like your label may be off or the sugar may be too high here. And they can make that change several months in advance before it's a little too late or they can meet the customer or the grocery store uh, demands for their product. Small iterative changes on existing products has uh, been really strong for us and we can uh, give them recommendations recommendations on adjustments. That's amazing. It's it's so cool to hear about the new capabilities and and what amazes me about this business is uh, obviously you do a lot of consulting and kind of advising, but there's a, a heavy focus on the software side, on the data side, and you you know previously have experience actually launching beverages, actually launching like actual food and drink items. How does this prepare? How does this prepare? How does this compare being on the more software and data side versus physically launching these food items? You know, for me, I just think about the pain points of my own experience and founder experience and R&D leads and innovators at these companies. It can be quite frustrating. You're, you have this great idea. You're super excited to launch it. It takes way longer. It's kind of like building a website or, you know, like building yeah. something new or launching your business. Like that takes way longer than you expected. And we don't want to lead you to this, sort of this like inspirational burnout. And when, when you have this directive or this intent um, to launch or change a product portfolio. And so for me, our team is doing the hard work of building on billions of uh, ingredient and product insights so that no one has to go through the process that I went through, especially when you're a founder, like starting a new company, right? Like you don't want it to just be in the marketing. A lot of companies can claim like, oh, we, this product is like good for your like 
immunity or like gut health or skin and that's just because you like heard um you know that one ingredient like collagen is is good for it right and so then you like powder a little bit of collagen in, in your bar your your drink and you sort of market that but then I'll just say it here like a lot of people are not quite comfortable with their claims and the claims don't even meet or, or don't do what the consumers think they actually are supposed to fulfill when they purchase these products. Uh, having the data there to support those claims, but also having uh, the information that you need to develop a product faster when you're inspired, I think is what helps our smallest companies. Uh, for the larger companies, they just want, they're looking for new opportunities to innovate. They have the buying power to buy the right ingredients, get them at the right price but they want to make sure that they're like transferring all their products to um, plant-based, for example, and they meet regulatory needs. That can also be frustrating, right? You may launch a product and it could be taken off the shelves because you use an ingredient that goes over threshold. You can launch a product and sell it to Canada and you may get fined in Canada or launch it in Mexico or Chile, and they have actually more strict sugar laws on uh, food products than we do. And so a lot of growing companies don't know this, and they end up uh, wasting a lot down the road. It's like the opposite of eating a pack of Gushers. Like Gushers, you hope it's going to last long and it goes super quick. The food space seems like the opposite where, oh, yeah, this would be easy. And then, oh, my God, this is like the toughest thing ever to build over time. It takes forever. So I think what you're doing is such a cool business and a really previously untapped area of the food industry. What do you think has been the biggest reason that Journey Foods has been able to, to grow and attract top clients and just the success you've seen so far? Everyone is using new innovative software uh, to improve their operations. This could be from like understanding your financial models or your customers a little bit better or optimizing logistics routes, understanding like your social media metrics. And so that's, that's just what we do with food products. As more teams and more founders embrace software and business analytics, we've just been a part of that value chain and more uh, team members and leaders are receptive to using business intelligence software, but also leaning into uh, software that has additional layers of like machine learning that can make decisions at a much faster pace. You know, if we think in terms of 2020, uh, food scientists are not like sitting around in labs uh, or teams, like the workforce is changing, right? And so uh, companies want to save money, uh, but they also are now working from home. And so we just, we've also been able to launch different products with great timing. Speaking of great timing, it is a great timing to start a podcast. If you want a podcast for your business or your brand, but you don't want to deal with all the behind the scenes details that it takes to run a podcast, email me at max at maxpodcasting.com. Now, I feel a pivot coming on. Let's pivot to inspiration and creativity. What allows you and team to stay creative and come up with these new solutions that are so helpful to your customers? You know, for me, uh, I just try to stay as involved. Like we're observing lots of trends outside of the food industry. One with software and tools. We regularly have team meetings to just talk about how excited we get on tools that we use that have literally nothing to do with the food industry. They actually just release a blog uh, to engineers and developers around the world to talk about asynchronous team management and different tools that we use that are fun. And we just jam on it. We're like, like Miro, for example, we just love the user interface and the flow and the way the website feels and the onboarding process for the customers, we think about the ins and outs of our favorite businesses. You know, I kind of have like the team thinking about their business experiences and the tools they use as if they were founders. 
right? So they're not just like using it, but they're like dissecting it. And uh, they get really excited when they learn about different tools and, and we have collaborative sessions on how we want, we want to embody that and bring the best practices from these other companies into Journey Foods. There's lots of companies that we're inspired by, whether we find them on Twitter or Product Hunt, or they reach out to us to offer services. And then we're like, oh, we like that email. <laughs> Your website header is dope, or uh, this PDF looks cool. Like it, there's just so many areas of inspiration. I spend a ton of time on Dribble, D-R-I-B-B-B-L-E.com. It's just a site where designers and UX experts just like drop all of their work. And I just, I love looking at everything from like 3D logos to new websites to animations. And it just really inspires me. And I also spend a lot of time at like galleries and around artists. Uh, and that, that inspires me as well. That's an awesome mix of different uh, exposures there. How do you divide your time? Like, do you make time in your calendar to kind of scroll through things or look through dribble? Like, do you have, uh, I guess, inspiration time? No, I don't have inspiration time. It just like happens. Uh, but that's a good idea. <laughs> I think, you know, sometimes I'm just inspired. I did start to block off like meditation and health and wellness time. And sometimes it comes up during those blocks, uh, like early in the morning. I don't really like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I have blocks uh, on my calendar until I did until 10. Now, because the team is more spread out across the world, I have to wake up earlier and earlier, but I stop work earlier, to do more things in the evening too. So it was just go really hard from like nine to five, which sounds crazy, right? But I found ways to work less. I also don't have to travel or commute. So that helps. Right. And we put more systems in place, uh, but there, I'm, I'm not going to say I don't, I don't only work 40 hours. Like there are definitely, I literally am running a panel uh, at 4 a.m. tomorrow um, out of Singapore. Oh my so, like, gosh. I, am, I was going to guess that. <laughs> I'm doing things at random times, but like my main work chunk, nine to five, I'll do a workout, meditation, have a trainer early in the morning, uh, you know, have some Spotify going that's just getting me in a great mood jump on slack and just jam with the team and, and have different uh, video sessions and then in the evening I may be sitting I set up a screen outside in the backyard I have like a sometimes I do zoom like on an 80 inch projector <laughs> like a, <laughs> no, like a 120 inch projector that's fun I'm just like looking at birds and trees and and uh you know, if you, if you love what you do and you figure out like exactly what brings you joy and balance throughout your day, it makes you so much more productive. And, and you know, we're still burning out and getting Zoom burnout and everything. Sorry about that. No, no, no. We can just keep iterating on um, our daily lives. And I've been so intentional about that because as sort of like a a solo founder, you know, I've had, I have co-founding team members, but I'm really sort of like the solo founder. It's just, we have to do that. But even if you're on a founding team, like we all burn out. Startups are hard, crunching lots of data, having big goals can, can be tough. Raising, raising millions of dollars, invoicing millions, millions of dollars is all tough. For me, I've just set a lot more boundaries. I uh, and found times that just bring inspiration because I'm finding ways to provide clarity to myself and reduce brain fog and just be joyful in my natural environment. I love the way you go about that. I mean, think of the two options. If you <laughs> you could head down the route more of inspiration or the route more of burnout. I mean, it's an easy choice <laughs> there. There's some some really straightforward choices to kind of go one way or the other. Yeah, but Max, I mean, we had this hustle culture that was very pervasive over the past decade and we were starting to switch a little bit and I was right in the middle of it. Like, don't sleep, like get up at five. And <laughs> Do a Singapore webinar at 4 a.m. tomorrow. Get the emails, but I'm, I'm fine with that, right? Because I am not working until 10 p.m. like every day. Uh, and so I'm really happy to like, hey, Google, set an alarm for 3.30 a.m., right? And, Your alarm 
alarm set for tomorrow at 3.30 a.m. Right, and it's like... <laughs> we got the guest appearance. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll wake up, throw on a jumpsuit or something, I don't know, and uh, have a great <laughs> conversation with some global uh, food folks based in Singapore. Before, I was like dead tired. Like I think I reversed age, at least externally. <laughs> I, I just urge everyone, listen, like, you don't have to be a founder, uh, but like if you are especially like really set more intentional practice around this and like you will feel anxious at first uh, like you're not getting anything done or you're letting things down but then you you know after a couple weeks few weeks you'll just start you'll hit all the right notes you'll be focusing you'll you'll figure out things that are like maximizing clutter you'll get rid of those you'll you'll be able to like see the wins in your day a lot more you know, sometimes you have to apologize or, or find ways to like make adjustments, but like it'll keep getting better. I think you're onto something with this reverse aging. And you mentioned Spotify. Speaking of Spotify, let's get to a fan favorite segment called the wild business shout out of the week. The wild business shout out of the week. <laughs> wild business shout out of the week. This is where we talk about a a campaign, an advertising approach, partnership, the counter attention. My Spotify, the Spotify stats, like year-end stats that they give you a few years ago, my I listened to something like 60 days of Travis Scott music. Like it was a ridiculous amount. So anyway, that, that's a few years back. That's a little precursor to this campaign. But Travis Scott and McDonald's had a hell of a partnership, which has like seen incredible buzz and sales results. You mind speaking about that for a little bit and kind of why why you think it works? Yeah, that's so exciting. I mean, I have been listening to music more than ever. I've been a diehard Spotify fan. Like when people say they use Apple Music, I'm just like, what is going on here? <laughs> uh, like it doesn't even pro provide half of the analytics or the experience. But um, I, I have Travis Scott, a couple uh, Travis Scott playlists uh, on my Spotify. We've been trying to make, for Journey Foods, we actually have been making playlists that we want to share with our customers of like podcasts, oh, that's awesome. but also food inspired rap music and jazz and pop and all that stuff. Yeah. Real quick. I have a fantastic podcast episode idea for you. We'll, we'll talk about that for, after we get done with this. <laughs> okay, okay. Cool. Cool. So culture and race, of course, has been a very big part of conversation throughout the year. I had a lot of calls uh, this summer around culture and inclusion and race and what I do discuss sometimes is just like it, I discuss the impact of culture and diversity in not just marketing campaigns but business growth at the end of the day African Americans uh, Latinx Americans make up you know a third of the country as we think about the impact of rap music R&B on today's business, uh, today's marketing, uh, that the Travis Scott move uh, was highly indicative of how much black culture can impact uh, and move business metrics. Uh, you're seeing it also with like Beyonce and Adidas, for example. And so everyone loves good music and everyone loves, you know, a good, excitable, a uh, joyous person, and that's Travis Scott. And um, <laughs> I tell uh, a lot of food folks that like one thing that has been very evident is that diversity in culture has not been as important for the food industry because we think of food as being altruistic, right? Like we're saving the planet, we're feeding the planet. I think that's a, a really bad approach uh, and sometimes companies get left out, uh, right? They're just like, oh, we, we are plant-based and we save some water. What we're going to start to realize, it doesn't matter what kind of company you're building, you still need to have inclusive efforts and an inclusive team. Uh, and it's still going to speak to a broader audience. It's still going to excite more people. Uh, and McDonald's, even though they've had like black CEOs in the past, that I've even worked with, decided to make a move to excite both Gen Z, millennials, 
uh, Black America and, and just fans of, of rap music and, and Black culture. But when you decide on the right thing, which is including all of America in your hiring or your marketing, then you, you're going to come out and win. And I think that's exactly what McDonald's did there. Yeah, that's incredibly well said. That's exactly right. And on McDonald's standpoint, it it completely changes it when you think of like a like, would you rather have a quarter pounder or a meal called the Travis Scott meal? Like it's like, it's like not even <laughs> in the same wavelength. Like to consider those, like one is much more exciting than the other, than the other one. Uh, and then on Travis Scott's end, he did that partnership with uh, Fortnite, where he's done like the virtual conferences. Or virtual virtual conferences. Wow, what a year! Virtual concerts. <laughs> we haven't been to any concerts though. You're totally fine with that. Exactly. <laughs> I don't remember what a concert is, but the virtual concerts. He, like, I think when it's all said and done, like he might have some of the coolest partnerships and like coolest marketing promo deals in history because yeah. it's just it's just so trend setting. Yeah, I mean, we need we needed that refreshment too, right? Like as much as we needed nostalgia this year in food. We we also needed like worlds to collide um, so that we could feel more comfortable and way more people are like, okay, I'm going to go try Burger King or try McDonald's because they have like a plant-based burger and because they like Travis Scott, right? And so uh, <laughs> they made the right decisions there. Yeah, they definitely did. All right, let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q&A. You ready for it? Yes, let's go. All right, let's get wild. So top five Travis Scott. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You mentioned 90s food, growing up in the 90s with and being kind of a, a guinea pig of all those candies and, and snack foods. And I'm not going to let you say Gushers because we already talked about Gushers, but what would you say was your all-time favorite candy? I probably liked Almond Joy too early for my age. <laughs> well, you're reverse aging. Yeah, I used to like absolutely kill hot tamales and jelly bellies oh i'm more yeah. of like a fruit, like our fruit based candy person than a chocolate based candy person but uh those two were were some of my favorites yeah gotta shout out jelly beans you're now living in austin what is your favorite part of austin so far i was talking to some friends about this recently i think you when people think about texas they think about just like flat land and cowboys the thing i love <laughs> about austin is it's sort of like on that plateau into the hill country and so you get great weather you get some lakes and water that you that i love from like living in chicago and new york uh you get hiking and then you get like great food and food trucks and and also music when it comes back because that's what we've been talking about but <laughs> you get to feel like a college student but also like you live in california all at the same time it's definitely different than like what you think of like a, a giant Texas, like flatland city. How about quirks? Is there something that maybe your friends or family call you out for? It's a little bit quirky, but it's just something about your personality. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I don't think I did it enough on this call, but I literally like to talk about everything in percentages. Well, well you did that about you know, 70% of the time. <laughs> right. Everything from like, uh, how a meeting went to a date to how much <laughs> data we've collected in the past week to how much I liked the trip or how much or how much I loved uh, a meal. I'll just say like my friends will they'll rate things to me in percentages and I can know what they're talking about and they'll say like you mean seventy eight percent and I know exactly what oh they're referencing. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's yeah. incredible. Like, I'll be talking about something and I'll be like the 78% one and I'll be like, yeah, that, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard of anybody doing that. That's so cool. And then you have been a lecturer or guest lecturer at a couple of awesome universities. What tip or advice do you have for somebody who does get the opportunity to be a lecturer at, whether it's their alma mater or a different university, but just to, to go back into the classroom and be on the teacher side of things? Yeah, there's a uh, there's a couple of cool Substack by uh, our newsletters, and I'm continually working on this. But the best part of, and, and I think the most important part of being a good lecturer is being a good storyteller. Uh, and we always can develop those skills. And so think about your story as much as possible. That's what kids want to hear. We don't infuse enough like real life things. And so I think students have 
been most excited when I like to sit down and tell them the real deal and, and not just like a sort of a class syllabus that bores the heck out of them, but like <laughs> really tell them the ins and outs and the, the roadblocks that they're going to have to face. Something that inspires you to get more than a 78% on your next test. <laughs> exactly. They remember the stories and laugh about them and share them. There you go. Well, Rihanna, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and your stories and percentages and, and all sorts of <laughs> sweet things. But thank you so much for coming on. Where's the best place for people to connect with you and uh, to learn more about Journey Foods? Yeah, this has been super fun. I uh, love your questions today, Max. I'm happy I can join. All my handles at Rihanna Lynn at R-I-A-N-A-L-Y-N-N uh, and at Journey Foods IO. Uh, or journey foods you can connect with us linkedin twitter instagram for me and the company uh you can also go to journeyfoodsio.com to sign up for our newsletter we like to send out two versions for like industry folks and then like general followers so you just learn about our news and other cool things that won't bore you uh so we hope we get some signups here uh but thanks so, so much again max really enjoyed it yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much. And then last thing here, final thoughts, stage is yours. It could be a, a quote, a line, whatever you want. Send us off here. 2021 is going to be better. We're going to get to some concerts. Stay kind. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, Rihanna, for coming on the podcast, sharing your story, sharing your tips, your lessons. And thank you, Wild Listeners, for tuning in to another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, Make sure to subscribe to the Wild Business Growth Podcast on your favorite app and tell a friend about the podcast. You can also find us on Good Pods. And for any help with podcast production, you can learn more at maxpodcasting.com. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!